All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another rainy uh, day here in Fresno. Today, we're going to be talking about manufacturing consent, media bias, the media, the history of media. I was actually a communications minor, sort of, in college. And uh, rather than, you know, really studying filmmaking and things like that, which we did do a little bit, a lot of it was like observing the media and, and talking about how the media works. And so um, I kind of want to run you guys through a little bit of story of like how people used to get the news. The, um, let's see here, the, um, uh, the, the news, where is my picture? Here it is. Got it. Uh, the news used to be dominated by these three guys. And basically every night people would tune in to the nightly news with one of these guys. And you got Tom Brokaw, um, Peter Jennings, and uh, uh, Dan Rather is the, the three guys up there. And basically their political viewpoints were probably, I would say, slightly left of center. And they were all fairly similar in terms of political orientation. And as such, while you had a choice of how to get your news, they were all more or less talking about the same stories every night. And, and they did try to be viewpoint neutral, which is good if you're a news organization. There's sort of a journalistic um, integrity and trying not to insert your own viewpoint into stories. And of course, you know, they did sometimes. And, uh, and sometimes it's more obvious than others. But in general, they at least try to maintain a pretense of uh, neutrality. Whereas nowadays, Fox, you know, is more or less pro-Republican, CNN is pro-Democrat, and MSNBC is pro-Democrat and things like that. It can be actually kind of refreshing looking at old news stories where they're just trying to report the facts and not editorialize uh, constantly on it. Uh, how many people here actually watch news broadcasts these days? Like, actually, you sit down and you, like, watch a hour-long program on, like, what events of the day took place. I'm actually kind of curious about this. Not me. Never have that kind of time. Yeah. Um, the... I mean, they still do hour-long shows. I don't know if they're exactly news shows there, right? Like, Tucker Carlson is a show. It's not news. It's more opinion, right? And so sometimes when your parents watch it, what is this on? Uh, so these are on the the big three uh, broadcast stations. And the reason why they're called broadcast stations is because back in the day, people would actually watch television over the air. You would have an antenna on your TV. You didn't have to pay for it. You didn't have to pay for cable, uh, which is what most people do these days. If they want TV, they have cable. Like very few people these days actually have an antenna on the back of their box. And, you know, you have to sit there and you have to adjust the antenna sometimes to get it to tune in. But yeah, you could watch ABC, NBC, or CBS, these three guys. And th that's why they were the big three. Eventually, cable came on the scene in the 80s. And then you started having alternatives to them with CNN and then later on Fox News, which was in 93, I think. Oh, I want to say it's around, maybe it was early, maybe it was sometime in the 90s. When did Fox News start? 92, 95, no, when, when did Fox News start? Ninety six. Okay, yeah. So CNN came out on cable in the eighties, and then uh, um, and then Fox came out in the nineties, and then there were five major sources of news in America. But for a long, long time, like we're talking from the sixties, the seventies, the eighties, uh, these three stations and and these guys ran the news in the eighties and nineties. Um, they basically had twenty years where they more or less controlled the the narrative in America. And so the topics that Americans would talk about were the topics they would hear from these three guys. They were probably, arguably, the most powerful people in America outside of, like, the president or senators and things like that. So 
Um, so yeah, ABC, CBS, and NBC are still around. Like they're not dead, although they're much, much less influential uh, nowadays than they were in the past. Sometimes students ask me, like, you know, what was life like in the '80s? And uh, the boring answer is that it's actually not very different. Um, everybody had cars and drove everywhere and went out to eat, and you know, society was not actually very different uh, than than it is now. Um, I kind of miss arcades. That was the thing. You would go to a place and play video games there. That was kind of fun because then like random people would sit down and play with you, you know, and so you could play street fighter against random people, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, it's all over the internet. You don't get to see them and things like that. It's probably a bit of a loss. Um, cell phones are another big change. Um, like it's, it's really hard to underestimate just how important it is to just be able to be out and about and talk to people. Uh, whereas, you know, if you get lost, you know, like you're trying to meet up with somebody somewhere, what you had to do before is you, you'd have to find a pay phone and then call them. And of course they're out because they're trying to find you. So you like have to call their mom and then they have to call their mom. And then the mom's like relaying things back and forth as you're like walking around the mall trying to find out where, where the other person is. And it's a giant pain. It's a giant pain. And so just the ability to just have a cell phone on you and just talk to people whenever you want is actually a big game changer. And the ability to get news uh, over the internet is also a big game changer. That came on in the 98 was really when internet news became a thing and, uh, and started toppling the sort of, uh, not a monopoly, but what's it called? Uh, uh, had you, what, what's it called when you have multiple people? Oligopoly, yeah. You have multiple people running uh, something. And so the internet has really kind of destroyed news in America, for better or worse. Like, I'm not I'm not a super big fan of having three sources for your news that are all the same source, essentially. I'm not really a huge fan of that. But at the same time, um, the way that most people get their... Well, actually, tell me, how do, you, how do you become informed about things these days? Like, if you wanted to, if you wanted to learn about Chop or Chaz, which was uh, three years ago in Seattle, uh, protesters after the uh, George... George Floyd uh, murder, they took over a chunk of uh, Capitol Hill in Seattle. How did you guys hear about this event? If you did, if you didn't hear about it, tell me. If you did hear about it, tell me. How did you, how did you learn about this event? Did you learn about it through watching a news show? Did you learn about it through memes on Facebook? How did you, um, how did you learn about this event? I'm just picking a random event because a, a former student of mine lives here. Like, I don't know if this is his apartment, but I'm going to say it is because it makes for a better story. This is his apartment right here, right over the, uh, the you know, where the autonomous zone was. Like right across the street from the park where the guy was shot, you know. Um, it's not his apartment, but like I said, it makes for a better story. So how did you guys hear about this? Uh, YouTuber memes? Yeah. Yeah, I got a slide on that. I was just told by the media. Cool. Uh, now we street fight random people. <laughs> Are you talking about... In real life, or <laughs> uh, um, so uh, I never know who to trust. Yeah, that's a, that's a big that's a big problem. It's 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 actually you wouldn't think it'd be that hard a problem, you know, because like somewhere in America, you should be able to find somebody who is a trustworthy news reporter. You know what I mean? Like there should be somebody who could just kind of like summarize the news for you and be like, here's what's going on in the world right now. And for some reason, that's impossible these days. Like, it's just an insurmountable problem. You can't find a single person who can give you a, you know, unbiased <clears throat> just window on the world. Here's here's what's going on in Ukraine right now. Here's what's going on with, uh, you know, Fresno, you know, this kind of stuff. So, uh, parents and social media, YouTube and memes, uh, news media, uh, social media clips on in Instagram. Yeah. And I don't, I don't feel like a uh, friend told you about it. Social media, social clips. I don't feel like Instagram is necessarily the most reliable source of uh, news. You know what I mean? The, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, you know, memes are funny, right? And, uh, let's see if I can pull up. Some memes here. Uh, memes are funny. So, like, uh, I pulled up a friend of mine's uh, Facebook account. He always posts memes. And so, 
and and they can also spread information. And so, one of the uh, one of the interesting things about memes is that the term meme actually comes from uh, Richard Dawkins, who's one of the more famous atheists out there. That's what he's famous for these days. And and the reason why memes are so powerful and and why they 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 spread rapidly through our culture and why they work so well at educating if they're true, you know, miseducating if they're false. Um, uh, people is because humans are story-based creatures. Like humans love a good story. We love uh, telling stories. We love hearing stories. For thousands of years, uh, humans just spread, uh, they just told stories to each other orally, right? You just sit around the campfire and hear a story. And then when you're older, you tell the story to your kids. And nowadays, you know, we still read fairy tales to our kids. And the fairy tales contain lessons for our kids. They learn how to act and what's good and what's bad and, and how to be wise and how to, you know, look before you leap. That's from Aesop's Fables. Right? There's a frog and he just like jumps into the well and dies or whatever, you know, and the story is you should look before you leap, you know, before you commit to a, you know, new college, you should look into it and see if, uh, see if it's the right college for you. And, uh, sour grapes with the fox and the grapes and things like that. In uh, Mexican culture, there's a story of La Llorona. The, uh, there's a woman that, like, if a kid goes by a river uh, in the middle of the night, she'll drown him. You know, don't go near the river in the middle of the night. And, you know, the reason for that is because, you know, it's teaching kids not to go out and endanger themselves in the middle of the night, right? And you do it by scaring them with the story of La Llorona, which the Fresno he. <laughs> That's funny. Um and uh, there's a funny story where, like, uh, when Detective Pikachu came out, uh, they accidentally put the uh, Urona um, movie on instead and scared the hell out of the, you know, seventh graders that were there to see uh, Pikachu. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, but this is how a society passes on its values. We pass on our values. We teach kids what's right and wrong based on these. It's like our cultural DNA, the stories that we pass on. And nowadays, it's um, memes, really, that, that spread through our society. And so a, a meme is a mental virus. It's a term coined by Richard Dawkins. And uh, the, the same way that, like, coronavirus spreads from person to person, a meme spreads from person to person. And so you see a funny story. You're like, oh, that's really funny. That's a funny meme. Click share. And then somebody else says, oh, that's funny. They click share. And this person says, oh, that's funny. And they click share. And the next thing you know, like this, uh, this meme here has uh, 3,000 likes and 928 shares. So you can almost see what the reach of the, of the meme is. It's been reshared 928 times. And on average, four people per share like it. And so what is this teaching? Let's read it. Gelatin is made of animal proteins. Does this mean you could use necromancy on jello cubes out of a small jiggly undead army well i hope so origin story for gelatinous cubes has been found so this is a DD &D meme so in dungeons and dragons there's a monster called the gelatinous cube which was one of the most lazy inventions by gary gygax i think ever it is a five by five by five cube that travels down dungeons which are always of course five by five by five uh, squares wide and the and the gelatinous cube just travels down the corridor cleaning the dungeons and you could walk right into it and get stuck inside of it. So, um, but what information, what thing does do, maybe some people not know. So as this meme spreads, it's also going to inform people of a real life fact that maybe they didn't know before. And what is that? What do you guys think? Somewhere within here, there's a real-life fact, not a D&D &D fact, a real-life fact that maybe somebody doesn't know. What is it? Am I going to have to take another long drink of coffee? Got no responses on chat. Good job, Chris. Yeah, gelatin's made for animals. A lot of people think that Jello is like a vegetarian food. It's not. So, 
uh, gelatin is made from animal protein. Um, so, you know, if you're a vegan, I don't know what's even going on here now. Uh, so if you're a vegan, like, you know, it's probably not the best thing. And then, uh, this is a little more subtle, uh, bug, uh, not bug. Um, the, the reference that's going on here is actually pretty subtle. Uh, this is, this is a meme called Lost, which is, uh, a reference to, you know, a horribly bad, uh, webcomic. And so you see the one person here, the one person, the shorter person here, the people right there, 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 and there. Right. So this is the Lost meme. It's, it's just people making fun of a bad webcomic is, is basically what it amounts to. Like, it's not like funny. It, it, sort of it's a meta meme. Like what's funny is like when people hide um, the lost meme inside of things like this, right? Because you see the person saying, you know, what is, who is this post for? It's not funny. It's not a meme. It's literally a middle school math lesson. Like die, you know? And, and so people are mocking cat girl John because cat girl John was not cool enough to recognize the fact that this is a lost meme disguised as, um, basically what I teach actually in game development, right? And game development for every object you have inside of a 3d world, you can translate it, you can rotate it and you can scale it. And, uh, and so there's knowledge here. This is actually, this is actually good, you know, linear algebra, 3d, you know, video game development, however you want to put it. Uh, it's actually valid knowledge and the reason why it's funny and the reason why, how many people have shared this? Uh, a thousand people have shared it and 2000 people have liked it is because it's a lost meme. And again, it's just you, if you're hip and you're down with recognizing this pattern in memes, you're like, aha, I see what they're doing there. It's like a meta meme. It's like, it's not funny. Like it's not inherently funny. It's not, it's just a bad web comic, but, uh, the joke is like there are these people who don't recognize it, but you're cool enough to recognize that it's lost and therefore it's funny. So, uh, somebody got a little angry on the internet. What, what, why would somebody get angry on the internet? <laughs> that never happens. Okay. So, so yeah, a meme is a mental virus. And so it spreads from person to person. And, and that's how, a lot of people get their news these days. They just sort of get it randomly. And I, I don't know if that's really good because a, a democracy, you know, the, the whole notion of democracy is that you have a well-informed electorate. That you've got people that basically can understand the issues well enough to vote on them, right? And that's why we don't have a pure democracy in America even is because a lot of Americans don't watch the news and things like that. So you hire somebody called your representative to represent you, right? So we have what's called a representative democracy. We hire a person and it's their job to be informed. And so not everybody has to be informed, but enough have to be informed. At least you can hire somebody who represents you well enough in Congress. And, uh, but here in America, in America, here in California, we actually do have direct democracy. We have these things called uh, the uh, initiative process where you can get uh, here in America. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Here in California, we can, uh, you can put a uh, initiative on the ballot and then people can directly vote yes or no. Do I want to um, eliminate Uber or something like that? Right. Like we had uh, that proposition kind of not exactly, but kind of on the, uh, on the ballot. Was it like two years ago? three years ago now. And, uh, the, uh, um, the state had passed a law basically providing benefits for gig workers, people who work for like DoorDash and Uber and Lyft and things like that. And, uh, it had, it, this is one of those things like, you know, it, it destroyed the part-time, um, journalism industry, right? Like they, they had a, a law that if a news agency used the same part-time reporter more than, uh, I don't remember the exact number. It was like eight times a year. They had to pay them healthcare. 
And so guess what? It destroyed all of the people who were working as gig reporters, people who would submit news stories and get paid a hundred bucks for it. Uh, they all got fired because the news agencies are like, we're not going to hire anybody from California anymore because we're not going to pay you healthcare for submitting a hundred dollar news article to us. And so it completely obliterated several industries in California. And, you know, some people would say, well, that's good. You know, they, they're not being exploited now. Yeah. But now they're unemployed. So I don't, I don't know if that's better. Um, and Uber and Lyft and DoorDash and companies like that fought back and put a ballot onto the initiative. And then Californians voted that they could be given an exemption to that law. And it's specifically, it's, it's a fairly narrow exemption. It's like just for certain, you know, members of the gig economy. It didn't completely overturn that old law. In fact, I think that journalism is still dead. Like part-time gig journalism is still dead in California as a result of that. But like specifically like Lyft and Uber don't have to pay benefits to their drivers anymore. They're not considered full-time employees. They're considered independent contractors, essentially. And so Uber and Lyft are still around um as a result of that for better or worse like you can have you can have your opinions on that like maybe they do exploit their people i don't know uh i know a lot of people that do uber and lyft and they're they're happy with the arrangement so i don't know um but in order for people to vote on that they have to be educated like you have to know enough about the tax situation like how do you get taxed as an independent contractor versus a w2 employee, you have to know about healthcare benefits, you have to know about the law that's being overturned partly, you have to know about the initiative. And so direct democracy requires a informed populace, an informed, um, you know, electorate. And when people aren't, then they have these campaign ads and the campaign ads for Uber and Lyft ran constantly. And so people would just get their knowledge from that, which isn't great, you know, because they're obviously biased, you know, and so... You don't want to have a situation where whichever side just spends more money on ads wins because that allows anybody with money to just write whatever law they want. And that's not good. Yeah, so, um, And so that's why this story today is like important. All right. So news stories will we'll cherry pick. Like if I could go back to yeah, these guys here. Like, they would cherry-pick stories, you know. They they definitely did. Like, they they made an effort to be impartial, which is good. But at the same time, like, the stories they ran were always the same stories that everyone else was running. Like, we're going to talk about the Gulf War today. And they're going to report on the events in the Gulf War and things like that. And and that's not good either, because if, if all of your news outlets are telling the same story, you're not getting different perspectives on it. And you're going to have a very blinded, you know, look at the world it's basically whatever viewpoint they have that's your viewpoint now and back in the day it was more or less impossible to get outside information you could read the newspaper you can listen to the radio uh and hopefully you know, like maybe the newspaper would have a different perspective or something like that but it's actually really hard to become well educated nowadays it's actually easier so the internet exploded the uh, the old news system in 1998 was what happened. How many people here have heard of the uh, Lewinsky, uh, Clinton Lewinsky scandal? The uh, Bill Clinton and uh, Monica Lewinsky. So uh, a lot of people haven't, like in the previous class, like half the people had just never heard of this. Um, just a little bit. Um, I mean, they actually came out with a documentary on it, like, or I don't know if it's exactly a documentary, but a sensationalized documentary. I don't know what you'd call it. Uh, about a year ago, best secretary ever. <laughs> she wasn't a secretary. She was a, um, uh, I don't know exactly what her what her title was. Um, uh, what what was her actual position there? I think she was just like a aide or something like that, like uh, intern. She was a White House intern. Okay, yeah. So ninety five, ninety six. Um, uh, Clinton engaged in like extracurricular activities with Linsky and the um, the uh, the media covered for him so the media tried its best to not um, 
to not talk about it. And in the past, that's worked, right? Like with a JFK, JFK allegedly, I don't know if there's truth to it, you know, it was uh, with Marilyn Monroe and, you know, various other people. Uh, I don't know if that's actually true or not, but whatever it makes for a good story. So uh, the media, though, wouldn't report on it. They would just, like, keep their mouth shut and then, you know, like there might be rumors circulating around, you know, probably probably not helped by Marilyn Monroe singing, you know, happy birthday, Mr. President, in a very sultry voice. Probably probably didn't didn't help matters very much. But um the uh the upshot was that like it was just kind of kept on the down low. And the media could do that because you had three news stations. And if all three of them agreed we're not gonna cover this scandal, there's no scandal. Like there's just no scandal. Like there might be rumors and you know, people, you know, probably say, oh, you know, you know, Bill Clinton, you know, and, you know, there's always rumors about, about, you know, politicians and things like that. But if the media conspired to not tell a story, there would not be a story. There would not be a scandal, would not be an issue. And it's true. Trust me, bro. And so uh, <laughs> I don't know. I have relations with that woman. Yeah, that was that was one of the famous lines. And then uh, one of the other famous lines from it was. It depends what the definition of is is, right? Like that was uh, under oath. Uh, yeah, and that's actually what Clinton got tagged for was that he denied under oath having sexual relations with Lewinsky, and then he, um, you know, uh, stated it publicly. And then uh, there's not a relationship or an improper relationship. And then he said, "Well, it depends on what the meaning of the word is is," which is. Uh, hilarious. <laughs> like, if you want to talk about red herring, like, that is probably the most um, red herring of all red herring. Well, it depends what the meaning of is. is. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and so they ended up getting DNA evidence that he had, uh, had in fact, had uh, some sort of relationship with Lewinsky. And what broke the story, though, was actually the Internet. So the internet existed, has existed, like it used to be called ARPANET, like back in the day. Like when I first used the internet, it was called ARPANET. And uh, I, and I, I, as like a, I don't know, eighth grader, ninth grader, got on ARPANET through my mom's account with the San Diego Supercomputer Center. And I'm like, cool, I'm on the internet. But you know, you, do you guys know how fun the internet is when nobody else is on it? I'm like, I'm in. There's no Google, there's no Yahoo, there's no YouTube. I can email people. Wait, nobody else has email. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I was on the internet in 92 and it was lame. It was super, super lame. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah. And so when do they change the name of it? Formally decommissioned in 1990. Okay. When I, maybe, okay, yeah, middle school. Yeah. 90 was, yeah, middle school for me. So, yeah. And then, uh, that's right. Yeah, I was on it in middle school in 90. And then I got on the internet, like when it became known as the internet in 92 or something like that. And uh, it was a little bit better than, like there were different places where you could, download uh programs for free on there by then um but the internet really didn't explode yeah they yeah the kennedys lobotomized uh one of their one of the sisters pretty pretty horrific um yeah and so the internet really exploded in 95 96 and uh, the the uh, media discovered it like, oh my gosh this internet's amazing and all of a sudden, everybody started using like AOL and CompuServe and Prodigy and and connecting to ISPs. And people would have these modems. They would scream at the phone, and, and then it, they would talk to the internet. And and all of a sudden, the internet became a thing. Like ninety five, ninety six, there's this massive exponential growth in the internet. And all of a sudden, there was stuff to do. Like you could there were search engines, and there was like you know people would make websites and. Uh, and share their websites with each other and things like that. Like it, it became a thing, but it didn't really topple the media oligarchy until uh, Usenet. Yeah, Usenet was like discussion forums, the distributed discussion forums. Um, UUNet. 
And so, um, uh, UCP protocol, uh, and, uh, hang on. Um, and there is Usenet for internet discussions and things like that. Yeah. Unix, Unix copy. And so basically you could send a, a message, uh, hang on. Okay, so what happened was uh, there's this website called Drudge Report. And so the media was trying to squelch the story and then Drudge Report started breaking the story of like Linda Tripp and Lewinsky and all this kind of stuff. And what happened was there's so much like public outrage and interest and then like news, like not the mainstream news, but like radio stations and things like that started picking it up. You ended up with uh, a lot of flack pushing against these guys and they were essentially forced to run the story. And then it broke nationwide and it led to Clinton being impeached actually for lying under oath. And so uh, that's kind of our topic here. So cherry picking, um, the news can choose to pick topics they wanna to talk about, right? And they can choose individual things to highlight and things to ignore. And so, um, and then in politics, they'll highlight a story like, oh, you know, Megan's Law. They named it after somebody named Megan and Magnitsky's Law, named after Magnitsky, who's an ambassador to Ukraine or something like that. I don't know. And, and because these things are more powerful when they're a personal story, because stories are powerful for people. And so uh, um, after the Charlottesville riots, you know, the National Teachers Association said they're seeing white uh, supremacists, white nationalists everywhere these days. And, and they weren't, they were just seeing it on TV, you know? And so by spotlighting an effect, you can make it look like, you know, something is very popular or something doesn't exist by just not looking at it. Like there might be a problem here. And if you just shine your spotlight on something else, then it's not a problem in America. But if you, you know, if there's a problem like, uh, you know, San Francisco, right, you shine a spotlight on San Francisco and you make it look really bad, then everyone's like, oh my gosh, San Francisco is a crap hole, you know, and there's needles everywhere on the streets and there's poop everywhere on the streets. And uh, actually there is the reason why I haven't been back to San Francisco. We used to go there all the time. I lived there for four years. Uh, the reason why my family has not been back there is because we were walking our little daughter down the street and there was a needle on the street. And I was like, nope. <laughs> um, and so sometimes the spotlighting is accurate. I'm not saying it's a lie even, but by choosing what, stories you talk about, you can control the national narrative as to what people are, um, are discussing. So there's a, uh, famous MIT scholar named Chomsky. He's a bit of a communist and by a bit, I mean a lot, uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, not to be confused with Nim Chimsky, the, uh, not to be confused with Nim Chimsky, the, uh, the, this guy. Uh, Noam Chomsky is a um, MIT scholar. He's old now, but he's still writing. Like he just came out with an article on ChatGPT the other day, and uh, he's a bit, bit of a bit of a uh, bit of a communist, uh, Holocaust denial, that kind of stuff. I'm not uh, a, a huge fan of the guy, but um, he's pretty influential in like computer science. Uh, Chomsky Normal Form was named after him, and in media criticism like manufacturing consent his book on the topic is pretty a very old very smart philosopher father of how we understand language yeah uh he's he's got his issues though but i mean like i said he's he's a pretty well respected um guy in certain uh, areas and so manufacturing consent was a book he came out with in 88 something like that and he's basically the, the topic of his book is why why are only some stories talked about right? That, that spotlight effect, that, that cherry picking, right? Why does the media only run certain stories and ignore other stories? Like there's a lot of stories in America, you know, million to one events happen 300 times a day, 330 times a day in America, right? Like there's a lot of interesting stories we could talk about. There's a lot of issues that people are debating. Why are, is, why is there such a narrow range of um, ideas discussed and alternatives discussed? And he came up with uh, four four ideas that you'd see here. The fifth one uh, was added in his second edition of Manufacturing Consent, which came out during, I think, the uh, second Gulf War. And so South Park came out with an episode on ChatGPT. I haven't seen it yet. I want to see it, though. 
So uh, this is what Noam Chomsky said. He said the bullet points one and two are actually pretty closely related. So news organizations will not run stories that are contrary to their financial interests. Okay. And, and this is one of the reasons why internet meme news is almost better, right? Because like nobody's got a financial interest in like Jello, right? Or whatever that meme I showed you earlier was, right? And and so having sort of the ground up news is is better in some aspects, even though you don't have the sort of vetting and like trustworthiness of like a news anchor putting their reputation on the line when they say, you know, Jello contains animal proteins. Um this whole meme culture bypasses all of these filters. And so it's an interesting contrast between the old, you know, like a person is laying down the news and the new, which is just random people saying random things that might be true. They might be false, but it sounds funny. So they get spread. So the first two bullet points are the news organizations don't run stories contrary to their financial interests. So if Coca-Cola advertises on NBC, uh, NBC will tend, it's not always, it's not 100%, but they will tend not to run any stories that are harmful to Coca-Cola. So if Coca-Cola is in Central America and they like start shooting workers protesting at their Coca-Cola plant, story doesn't make it to America, right? Because, uh, you know, Coke will probably advertise on all three of the major networks. We're talking like back in the 1980s and all three of the major networks are taking money from Coca-Cola. And so, hey, there's just other topics we could be talking about right now. And so Coca-Cola might be doing absolutely horrible things down in Central America, and it just doesn't make the news. Uh, and this happens a lot, like the uh, Dow Chemicals, you know, the, the Bhopal disaster, right? Uh, I don't know, has, has anyone heard about this, the Bhopal chemical disaster? Um, have you guys seen this? Have you heard of this? South Park reference. Um, yeah, it killed 3,700 people. Uh, there was a chemical plant making pesticides and there was a leak and it, the chemicals rolled downhill and murdered, you know, thousands of people, 574,000 injured people. Uh, this is from Dow chemicals, right? Like Dow, like it's, you know, one of the, uh, the back in the day you call it, it was called union carbide, but nowadays it is called Dow and, uh, after ready industries, India. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. After a disaster like that, uh, you want to change your name. $10 billion of claims, uh, lawsuit, the game 3.3 billion, final settlement was half a million. And so, um, yeah. Uh, let me make sure that it was Dow. Chem Dow Chemical purchased it. Yeah, okay. There. So, uh, maybe, maybe, yeah, to be to be more precise, they, Dow purchased the company that uh, they caused the disaster. It wasn't Dow back then. All right. 3,700 people died. How many people have heard of it? Nobody has heard of it on chat. Nobody has heard of this disaster, which, like, how many people died in 9-11, right? 9-11 deaths. And this is, in some ways, like, like, being killed by inhaling pesticides, like, that's, like, I, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to say it's worse than 9-11, but 9-11 killed 2,600 people. Uh, the overall death toll, 3,000 people. Like, more people died in this event by inhaling poison. Like, it's like chemical warfare, you know? Like, wow, you know? And 574,000 people inhaled chemicals uh, but didn't die from it. Like, one of the absolute worst things, like, in, in, in history. And, like, nobody's heard of it, you know? 1984, nobody's heard of it. Happens a lot. Like, sounds like what happened in Ohio. Yeah, except in Ohio, like, you know, uh, there was a train wreck and everyone saw the train wreck and, you know, and and we heard about it, you know, and, and 3,000 people didn't die from it, right? So what happened in Ohio in East Palestine, there was a train wreck and this is why you got to follow the news, you know? Um, and so there was a train wreck and the uh, train was carrying chemicals and it, uh, let's see, there's a, let's see if anybody died. Uh, 
don't know if anyone died from it. Uh... But it wasn't like the Bhopal chemical disaster, right? So everyone's water is now poisoned, yeah. And so, uh, so basically, yeah, it, like we we heard about that one, right? Uh, but you know, if it's in India, well, not as important, I guess. So, anyhow, so the uh, the ownership and advertisers. So most of the news companies are part of a large media conglomerate. Right. There's no independent news uh, of any size. Like there are independent news agencies. They're just tiny. Right. None of the none of the major news sources in America are independent. The um, you'd argue that maybe. I'm not going to argue. Um, you'd probably argue that point. But um, but like let's talk about like NBC, like NBC News is owned by General Electric. Right. And so General Electric makes. A lot of things, light bulbs, uh, MRI machines, ultrasounds, they make a lot of things. And so if GE MRIs start, I don't know, exploding and killing people or something, then there is a strong tendency for NBC to not run that story because they're part of a media conglomerate and they don't, they tend to not run stories that are harmful to the, um, harmful to the, it, it wasn't on train breaks, the, uh, the derailment was caused by, I think, the bearings on the train overheating, if I recall correctly. I could, I could be wrong on that. So, um, and so certain stories just don't get run. And Chomsky noted that all three of the, you know, large uh, broadcasting corporations all have the same general interests in mind, right? They're all large multinational conglomerates and things like that. And so none of them run stories that would say, hey, like, maybe we shouldn't have large multinational conglomerates, or maybe we should regulate them more and things like that. Those stories just never, never appear, even though, even though the news stories are all center left, um, ABC, NBC, CBS are all center left, uh, according to like, at least Harvard, you know, everybody will argue that point ad nauseum, you know, but basically, you know, the, the research shows that they're kind of a little bit left of center. Um, the, uh, even though that, and, you know, left-wing people oftentimes say, oh, we need to restrain corporations and, and you know, stop monopolies and things like that. For some reason, it just never makes it onto the news because uh, they are, are part of these large media conglomerates. So uh, the sources of uh, a story also tend to get protected. If you're a political reporter in D.C. and you've got a, you got a top-notch source, like you've got like a senator that's willing to like meet with you in like some smoke filled room in a bar in DC every week. Um, you don't run anything contrary to that Senator, you know, or you don't, you you don't run anything that makes that Senator look bad, right? Like this person's a scheming, you know, no good two bit politician. You do that once and the person won't talk to you again. Right. You can, you can run a negative, you can run a negative article about your source once and then they're not your source anymore. Right. And so what, what that does, though, is that, that introduces a bias where uh, political reporters will protect their sources, not just like their an anonymity, 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 that's a great word, not only the identity of their source, but they will protect them from criticism and negative um, assessments of their performance. And there's also viewpoint discrimination, too, because the story is going to be told from the point of view of that senator. And it won't be told from the point of view of somebody else who might have a different perspective on the matter. And that that viewpoint discrimination is actually one of the big problems that Chomsky's talking about, is that when you scrub opposing viewpoints, you get a very one-sided view of reality. And so the, the good news is um, there's this stuff called flack. And now flack is often used to suppress stories because flack means pushback against the media. Like when people get upset and they write in, they're like, I'm not going to watch NBC Nightly News anymore because you ran a story on blah, 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 blah. Um, news agencies hate that. They don't want people to stop watching their show, right? And so they're they're fairly, they're fairly, uh, what's the right word? Um, uh, timid as far as like, 
you know, they don't, they don't really want to take big risks and run stories that are kind of like if he, that's what got Dan Rather fired. Like the, the, the guy in the middle here is Dan Rather. He got fired because he ran a story that was critical of George W. Bush based on a lie. He, he reported fake news basically and he got fired for it. And, um, news agencies hate that kind of stuff. And so they will tend to not run stories because they're afraid of the pushback they'll get from it. That said, sometimes flack can cause them to run stories. For example, the Monica Lewinsky thing. Uh, everyone's like, why are you not talking about this? Like, Drudge Report's been running this story for weeks, and Talk Radio is talking about it. ABC, why are you not running the story? And so finally, push them into running these stories. Um, flack, aka anti aircraft. Well, yeah, well, this is metaphorical flack. And then uh, Chomsky wrote, anything contrary to the war on terror gets scrubbed. Uh, that was true for about a year. So after 9-11, there's about a year where you cannot say anything negative about the war on terror. And then it very quickly went the other way, right? Where uh, it, it became uh, very unpopular. And uh, and so that fifth point, I don't think is very true at all. It was true, it was true briefly, you know, because there's this big patriotic kind of fervor after 9-11. But... Um, uh, nowadays, I, w I would not say the war on terror is especially popular at all. So, the uh, um, yeah. So, despite the left and right divide between Fox and CNN, like they're both large media conglomerates, and so they tend to run the same kind of thing. And they're also sort of invested into the Democrat Republican divide, right? And so you will, when you want to have opposing viewpoints on the news. They'll bring in a Republican and a Democrat. They don't bring in other viewpoints because there are more than two viewpoints in politics. There's quite a few political parties in America. Just none of them have any power because the way our voting system works, when you have a voting system called first past the post, which is what we have, it results in there being two political parties. And so uh, first past the post means one candidate with the highest votes wins. And so when you have that, it's a really bad idea to have five political parties, because if three of those political parties merge together, they will beat the other two 100% of the time, assuming they were all roughly the same size. And so that, so everybody merges together and you have the Democrats and the Republicans, and there's this sort of weird conglomeration of like lots of different viewpoints and lots of different viewpoints. And, and they sort of end up getting homogenized into Democrat and Republican. Uh, like if you look at Alaska, Alaska changed their voting system. They changed it to, uh, I think it was either ranked choice or uh, instant runoff. I don't remember which one. And the only time, the only time I saw in the news that being discussed was on Fox. And that was from a Republican talking about how it was destroying democracy. And so uh, the anything that's like contrary to like the, the two party system doesn't get picked up by the by the mainstream news. And so the good news is the good, yeah, you can watch this of like the same, you know, the same script being read across the nation. You can see all the different, you know, businesses that are owned. And these are just media. Like this doesn't go into like, you know, GE and that kind of stuff. Uh, you can watch this video too. This is all, I, I'm not going to show this due to copyright reasons, but this is the Mediopoly skit from SNL, which is quite, quite hilarious. But the good news is nowadays we have the internet and for better or worse, like <laughs> internet news isn't exactly the best thing, but you can at least uh, go to websites like Drudge, which is still around, uh, Ground News, which I've just started using this, this semester. And you can, you can click on blind spot here and it'll, it'll show you stories that if you're right wing and all you watch are Fox or something like that, then these, um, stories you've probably not heard and contrawise if you only listen to left-wing news then these are stories that you probably haven't heard and so it's a really neat feature and i i'm a really big fan of ground news as a result of this because it's there to like try and give you different perspectives and it'll tell you you know what the political orientation is on different stories and so you can and it'll code them on their factuality and things like that so my advice to all of you Try and become informed. Try and learn things. Don't don't just get your news from the media. Uh, don't don't just like the mainstream media. Don't just get your news from like YouTube. Don't just get your news from like memes on Facebook or Instagram. 
try to try to broaden your source of knowledge. Try to get input from as many different sources as possible. And when they conflict, dig into it. Figure out what the actual truth is. And you know, somebody says this, somebody says the opposite. Research it. Like try and figure out, okay, which one of these people is right. And that's what comes down to the essence of being a critical thinker. And it comes down to the essence of like democracy and like being an informed voter and like freedom and like at the American flag and eagles screaming and things like that. Okay. So that's it for me today. Uh, I will be in uh, Toronto for the next uh, f five days or so. Uh, I've already recorded the lecture for Wednesday. You can watch that now, but the quiz won't open until Wednesday. And then I'm going to record a uh, probably follow up lecture to this one. I haven't decided quite yet. Uh, for uh, for Friday. And so watch the video when the time comes and um, take the quiz and then I'll see you guys again on Monday. All right. Peace out.